Hey guys, Sam here with Game Plan TUND. I'm really excited because this is episode number 10 for us. We finally cracked double digits and it doesn't seem like much, but I'm proud of the platform so far and I'm so grateful to all our guests and everyone who helped us get to where we are today. That being said, there's plenty more work to do to ensure that we continue to bring you guys stories of inspiration and insight and success over adversity. Today's episode, we're coming to you with a moving story of positivity and resiliency. Billy Frederick, who recently graduated from UC Santa Barbara, played baseball in the College World Series. Billy is continuing his athletic endeavors after college with some new and exciting challenges, which we will discuss in the episode. In addition to T1D, Billy is a cancer survivor. His relentless spirit was incredibly powerful to hear, and it was a pleasure getting a chance to speak with him. Please enjoy my conversation with Billy Frederick. All right. Well, with that, welcome to the Game Plan T1D podcast. I'm your host, Sam Benger. On the Game Plan T1D podcast, we explore the lives of successful athletes and performers living with T1D to try to uncover what it is that allows them to excel despite their diabetes. Today on the show, I'm lucky enough to be able to be joined by Billy Frederick. Billy, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Sam. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Definitely excited for this conversation based on your background, but for the audience, why don't you take this chance to kind of tell the audience who you are, where you're coming from, and uh, kind of give them a little bit of a background on who you are. Sure. Um, so, yeah, my name is uh, Billy Frederick. Um, I live in California. So I was, uh, I've been a baseball player my whole life uh, since I was five, um, ever since T-ball. So when I hit age 11, Um, I was at baseball practice. I remember this and I had no energy whatsoever. Um, I could barely move. So my, my dad took me out of practice and we went to the hospital and we got my, uh, my blood checked. And I think it was 695 was my blood sugar. So yeah. So my uh, doctor told me that I had type one diabetes and, um, I asked him, can I still play baseball? And he says, yes, absolutely. He, he told me that he would prefer that I stay active. You know, it, it helps uh, my blood sugar. So that was, that was good news there. So yeah, that was when I was 11 and I continued to play baseball in little league right after that. Um, I got a, a Medtronic insulin pump. Um, I think when I was 12, um, it was not long after I was diagnosed, I got my pump. Um, and I've been using Medtronic ever since for, you know, about 12 years or so. I'm 23 now and I really like it. The pump definitely helped when I would play, uh, play sports and exercise. And also it's it's a lot nicer too, because I don't have to shoot insulin into me whenever I eat. Um, So Mm -hmm. that's nice. But yeah, so I continued to play baseball and was lucky enough to get a scholarship to UC Santa Barbara and played there for four years. And we made the uh, College World Series in 2016 in Omaha, Nebraska. That was uh, so much fun. We were on the road for 23 days. We stopped at Nashville to uh, play regionals against Vanderbilt. And then we went to Louisville, Kentucky to play the University of Louisville for Super Regionals. And then we went to uh, Omaha, Nebraska to with the other uh, seven remaining teams for the World Series. My mom had to ship me uh, insulin and uh, pump supplies because I was running low after the 23 days. But yeah, that was the time of my life. So much fun. It was in 2017 last year, finished playing baseball and uh, I graduated from UCSB. And so, yeah, we're, we find ourselves at this point now and I'm still uh, trying to remain active. I am continuing to lift weights and I'm preparing to climb Mount Whitney in uh, California. It's the highest mountain in the contiguous United States. So that's my next goal that I want to have. You know, I'm a goal based, goal oriented guy. You know, I always Mm -hmm. have to have to face a challenge, you know, and after baseball is done, I I want a new challenge. So that's what I'm trying to do. And uh, oh, and I also got a freestyle Libre blood sugar monitor, continuous blood sugar monitor. And I really like it. My blood sugar has been really good ever since I got it. I checked my seven-day average yesterday, and it was 135, I think. Wow. Um, So, yeah, it's just been – it's been really helping. I really like it. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's – you know, there's so much to 
your story as we were kind of talking before this recording. So I want to kind of proceed in a somewhat chronological order. I wanted to go back to your childhood growing up and kind of how you found that passion for baseball. You mentioned that your dad actually built a batting cage in your backyard. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you, do you remember this period sort of pre diabetes and what was that sort of like when you discovered that you had a passion for baseball? Yeah. Uh, my dad put me in T-ball when I was five. And at that point I was like, okay, whatever. You know, I, I didn't really enjoy it. Didn't really hate it. I just, I just did it because my dad told me to do it. A couple years later, I really started to enjoy it and love it. And yeah, so I was about, you know, seven or eight. Yeah. My dad built a batting cage in our backyard made out of PVC pipe and we laid this netting over it. So it was basically a PVC pipe sort of box structure and we mm -hmm. laid netting over it and then my dad bought a pitching machine so he measured out the pitching machine distance from home plate to major league distance and he would crank it up to you know 95 you know not this was not when i was eight but when i was older <laughs> in high school like he would yeah he would uh crank it up to 95 and, and we would have you know a major league simulation batting practice and me and my dad did that a lot, and me and my dad were talking about it, and we really enjoyed those days, me and him hanging out in the backyard during the summer and hitting. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that sounds like a, a dream type of situation, kind of father-son scenario, but also development as a baseball player as well. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you're playing baseball, falling in love with the sport, and then we kind of have a shaky period, um, you know, a diagnosis at age 11. What was that period like? What was the transition process for you? Obviously, at 11, you're still very young, but at, at the same time, there are parts of your life that have kind of started to solidify from, you know, what foods you prefer to eat to kind of just how you go about your life. So what was that transi transition period like for you? Yeah, it was difficult at first. Um, one thing that I re really remember is being embarrassed about it. Um, it was uh, during the summer this happened, and so um, I had to leave baseball early and just take time off, you know, to get my blood sugar down and figure out how to take insulin, how much to take, you know, how many carbs are in food, all that stuff. So, so it, it took me like a long time before I got back into the swing of things. But I remember I was being, I was really embarrassed. My parents told me. Uh, when I go back to school in the fall, that I have to tell two of my best friends that I'm diabetic so they would know how to help me if I went into shock or anything. Mm -hmm. So I remember telling my, my two best friends, and I was really nervous and embarrassed about it. But as time passed, I, I learned to accept it and be proud of who I am. And I did have to change my diet a little bit. Obviously, I had to take shots every time I ate uh, before the pump. So it was hard to get shots, you know, four times a day, five times a day. It was hard because before I would just go to the doctor's office once a year and get, get a flu shot or get some shot and that would be it. But this mm -hmm. became a daily thing and it, that was a hard thing to deal with. But again, over time, I just got used to it and learned to accept it, but it wasn't, it wasn't an easy process. That's for sure. Yeah. I think it certainly takes time as is the case with anything, but I wanted to ask, Billy, during that period after your diagnosis and heading into high school, heading into college, were there any diabetic failures or, or instances where you had a severe low that sort of served as a learning experience for you? Well, I would say uh, fortunately, no, nothing serious. I never had to go to the hospital or, or anything um, for any highs or lows, um, but I, I did have a time where I was at a baseball game and my blood sugar was high. So I took insulin and I didn't allow enough time for the insulin to work. So I checked my blood about 20 minutes later and it wasn't coming down really. So I took more insulin and then I checked 10 minutes later and it still wasn't where I wanted it. So I took more insulin and luckily it didn't get um, dangerous, but I went really low and I had to uh, come out of, of the game and sit it out. But that was definitely a learning experience for me right there, not to overstack the insulin uh, and, and let it work. Yeah. And my, my dad made sure I never I did that again. He had a long talk with me never to, to do that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I've certainly experienced that as well. And when you're trying to battle cortisol and stress, especially in an athletic situation, like before a game, your body just does not respond as it normally does to insulin. And obviously you want to perform at a high level. So you're really trying to drive down that insulin, drive down that blood sugar with excess amounts of insulin. And then all of a sudden you're playing and it kind of catches up with you. So I think that's a really common thread amongst athletes that other people with D1D and athletics need to be aware of. Give yourself a normal normal bolus, even if you are, um, you know, 300 before a game, because if you do over bolus and you really try to drive it down aggressively, you're going to crash. And obviously it's better to err on the side of caution during a game. Yeah. And I noticed that stress really, really influences my blood sugar. I can go high so quickly. And that's one thing I always had to uh, take note of my, my nervousness level. If I was really nervous, I would expect to be high, you know? Mm. Did you try to come up with any sort of coping mechanism for the stress, be it like a breathing pattern or something like that? Or was it more just a general awareness of that? Well, yeah, I, I learned to be more aware of, of my stress level. That was, that was a big thing. But as time went on, I started to get less nervous before games, uh, especially throughout college. But yeah, I, I never ad- adopted a, like a breathing technique or, or anything to, to cope with my stress. Uh, maybe I should have. That, that mm. sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I've heard some athletes adopt that. And Chris Freeman, who was an Olympic cross-country skier, who we had, the, who we had on the show, was actually a big proponent of that. And he said as I kind of went through this cycle of breathing, I could actually see on my CGM, my blood sugar start to plateau and eventually come down. So it works for some people, I think, too, just like you said, a general awareness of that is really important as well. But I wanted to get to your time at UC Santa Barbara. I'm extremely jealous of the the school (laughs) location. I'm a huge Southern California fan, um, even though I'm from Boston. But tell us a little bit about how you came to settle on that school and what the, the recruitment process was like and obviously the transition as well to playing college athletics. Yeah. So my dad sent out a bunch of my highlight tapes to colleges. He like put it on a DVD and he sent, he sent it um, all around California and stuff like that. And UCSB uh, liked it and they had me come and they gave me an offer. And after we came back home, uh, my dad told me that I should take it. And I wasn't really aware of all of the colleges back then in high school. Um, I don't really know why. I just wasn't really into learning about all the schools and where they were and stuff like that. I was just just into playing baseball, like, in the present. And so he told me to take it, and I was like, okay, Dad, you know, you know more than I do in terms of schools, so, so I'll, I'll accept UC Santa Barbara. And uh, that was a great decision, a great choice that my dad uh, told me to do. I I went through another learning process my freshman year because I would have to do everything on my own now, make food, go to like choose a time when to go to bed, mm-hmm. choose how much sleep I should get, you know, all that stuff. And that was hard to to control my blood sugar because I was so busy especially at college, I would ride my bike to class. I would play much more baseball than I would in high school. And I experienced a lot of lows during college because I was just so busy. But, but after a while, I learned how to control my basal rate on my pump. And uh, I learned more of what foods I should eat, what, what helps that, and how to, how to better combat highs and lows and all that stuff. So, yeah, I I definitely went through another learning process my freshman year. Certainly. Yeah, so I wanted to ask, Billy, I think a common thread amongst diabetic athletes as they head into college is, and and really anyone diabetic or otherwise, is that added sense of independence. And that can be a great thing, and it it can force us to be more accountable for our diabetes and just of of ourselves in general. Or it can kind of lead us to push diabetes to the back burner. How were you able to make sure that that wasn't the case and that you stayed dialed in in terms of your treatment and your management of T and D? Yeah, my baseball performance would be very influenced by my blood sugar. If I was high, 
I couldn't uh, run hard. I couldn't swing hard. I couldn't throw hard. My body would just get just tired and achy. And so my, my performance would suffer in that. Um, and also, of course, lows, too. I would get weak and shaky and dizzy when I was low. And baseball requires a lot of, a lot of mental focus. Mm-hmm. And, and you need, you, if, you're, if your brain is low on sugar, then it can't focus well. So, so that baseball is one thing that really made, you know, made me uh, really focus on my blood sugar because I, I needed that. I definitely needed that. And plus, if my blood sugar was low or high, I wouldn't be able to sleep good. And then the next day, I would be tired at practice because of that. So my whole life would revolve around how good my blood sugar is, you, you know, as an athlete. Mm. So that was definitely a motivation for that. But, but I, I always had the motivation to keep my blood sugar good, even before college and, 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 and independence. But college definitely helped me learn how to be independent. Yeah, I think it certainly sounds like you did a fantastic job of managing it as you kind of transitioned to college. You referenced UCSB made it to the College World Series. Talk about that experience. You were on the road, you said, for 23 days. Um, Mm -hmm. Had to be shipped insulin, had to be shipped different diabetic supplies. How are you able to continue to stay dialed in during that period? And what was just that process like overall? You said it was sort of the time of your life. So tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, it was so much fun. So we took finals in Kentucky. So we were going through school, through the regionals and super regionals. And uh, right before we got to Omaha, we were done with finals. So they they basically flew out some people to proctor our tests, our finals, um, in the hotel room in Kentucky. So right after base, uh, I mean, right after school was done, we all all our job was was to play baseball in Omaha and, you know, play baseball in this huge stadium on national television. So, you know, I had no other worries about anything. It was only about baseball <clears throat> and, and it was just awesome. I felt like a major leaguer. They, they treated us like major leaguers, that's for sure. And I got to play in a major league like stadium. So yeah, I, it was the time of my life. I had so much fun. And I remember in Nashville, my blood sugar would never come down. And it could be from one or two, two reasons. Nashville was very hot and humid. So the insulin could have gotten hot and caused it to not work as well. Or it also could have been adrenaline because this was, I think, right after we won the regionals. So... So I was I was really excited and I couldn't contain myself because we're going to the super regionals now and and uh, it was really hot so my insulin wasn't really working so I had to go pick up another vial at Walgreens but that was a weird time and and yeah it was it was hectic it was hectic because everything new was happening over there so that was one thing I had to battle but but after that my blood sugar leveled off, <clears throat> leveled off, and I was able to play, and uh, it, was, it was just off. So looking back on those 23 days, is there a moment or a day that kind of stands out to you as being a high point of that experience? Yeah, we were playing Miami in the College World Series. This was game number two. There was a man on third, and I was up to bat. And my coach gave me the squeeze sign. So basically, so I'm the batter. So I bunt and the runner on third runs home. And that is a very hard play to defend for the defense. And if done right, it's, it results in a, a score um, at home plate. So I remember he gave me the squeeze sign and I looked up around the stadium to all the people, and I thought to myself, no one knows what I'm about to do here. I'm going to surprise everyone in the stadium. And so the, the pitcher threw me a fastball, and I bunted it, and the runner at third scored. And that was definitely a high point because, because that, that was just a cool, cool experience. 
Absolutely. I think across different sports that uh, being able to drive in a run, you drive in a teammate or, you know, my background is football kind of scoring and, um, you know, mm-hmm. celebrating with your teammates. It's that camaraderie and brotherhood. And it certainly sounds like you guys had a fair bit of that, you know, being on the road for 23 days, taking finals together away from school. Do you think you were able to rely on those guys from a diabetic management standpoint as well? Were they aware of your condition and how did you kind of lean on those guys throughout that process? Yeah. So everyone knew that I was diabetic. Uh, everyone knew that I would check my blood throughout the game and drink Gatorade when I was low. That's my go-to drink. So yeah, they, uh, they all supported me and they knew what was going on. If I went and sat down in the dugout during practice um, and the coaches knew too, and they were very accepting of that and they let me sit down and, and take care of myself. And that was one thing, too, that I was worried about when I was really young is I don't know if the coaches will get mad at me if I sit down during practice, but every coach I've had, you know, understands and, and is willing to help me when, when it comes to blood sugar issues. So uh, that's one thing that I would, I would tell to other diabetic athletes, the, the kids out there. You know, everyone's here to help you, you know, with diabetes, and everyone's rooting for you. So don't, don't feel bad. Uh, don't feel like you're letting the team down when you have to sit out uh, because, you know, that's just the way life is for us. And, and everyone else understands, and, um, and everyone treated me really great on my teams uh, with diabetes, and, and they were always willing to help. Yeah, I remember one time in college, I was at my friend's house, and I went really low, and I ran out of stuff. So my friend ran to 7-Eleven. He biked. He biked to 7-Eleven as fast as he could and got me a Gatorade and brought, brought it back. And, yeah, I'll never forget that. Um, yeah, that, that he was one of my teammates. So that was an awesome thing he did. And, yeah, my teammates were uh, very accepting of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's always really humbling and moving to see friends kind of springing into action. And I think every diabetic can kind of point to a time where they were in a rough spot and, you know, they didn't have glucose tabs or, or you know, a Gatorade on them, like in your case. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, a friend or a family member or, um, you know, someone in some sort of supporting capacity kind of jumped into action and was there to kind of save the day. And it's, uh, it's important to know that those people want to do that and that in no way are you being a burden on your team as an athlete yeah. or just on anyone in any sort of environment by having diabetes. You know, they, like I said, those people want to be there. They want to be there to help you. Mm-hmm. But I, I wanted to bring up outside of diabetes, you battled a, another chronic illness in mm-hmm. cancer. And I, I wanted to get your take on what that experience was like and in not only being a diabetic, but also being a cancer survivor as well. It's just a quite an accomplishment and a testament to your toughness and your ability to overcome adversity. So talk to us about that experience. So I had stage one testicular cancer, and this was August of 2017. Yeah, yeah, August of 2017. And it was really hard. It was it was really hard time. Um, There were points where I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what the outcomes were going to be. There were times where we didn't even know if it was a good cancer or, like, for a better word, like uh, a less dangerous cancer or the dangerous mm-hmm. cancer. <clears throat> we we weren't we weren't too sure which one it was, and so those times were were really hard with all the uncertainty that that was going on. But once we found out exactly what it was, and we found out all the procedures that that I was going to go through and all that stuff, um, it started to to be less scary because I, I knew what was going on. And so I, I took uh, chemotherapy in September, I think, and it was stage one. And so I only went in for a day and got an IV just for a day. So that was fortunate for me, but, but yeah, uh, that was definitely tough. Chemo made my blood sugar go high and I, for the next week or so, I could barely move because I was just so like tired and beat up from the chemo mm-hmm. because it's basically poison. So, so yeah. And yeah, I had blood sugar issues there, but I would say diabetes 
in my prior life um, helped me be able to cope with it a little bit because I'm used to needles. I'm used to closely watching my body and, and taking care of it and, and changing my schedule um, in order to accommodate for, for my diabetes and all that stuff. So all that stuff was not new to me. But, but yeah, I, I would say life with diabetes uh, helped me be better prepared for this. So I am cancer-free now, so, so that's great. And, but I still got diabetes. That's probably not going to go away for any time soon. But, mm -hmm. but I'm managing it, and I, am, I, I'm, I conquered cancer, and um, every day I'm choosing to conquer diabetes. And it's a battle every day. It's not easy. But, um, but I choose not to be knocked down, and I, I choose to, to conquer and, and to uh, take control. Yeah, diabetes is one thing that really taught me how to uh, battle adversity uh, through baseball because baseball, there's a lot of striking out and all that stuff. So, so yeah, you know, I learned how to face adversity through, through diabetes, that's for sure. I love the message, Billy. And it's, I wanted to ask you because, I mean, there are people that are positive and I certainly sense that you're one of those people. But, you know, in August of 2017, you get that diagnosis and – what was going through your mind at that point? Obviously, you mentioned that diabetes kind of prepared you for this, and certainly the adversity in athletics can help prepare you for um, dealing with the adversity of a of a cancer diagnosis. But how are you able to stay in that positive frame of mind with this second diagnosis, this second chronic illness kind of cropping up? Yeah, I definitely went through a dark time, though. You know, I was really upset and and angry and embarrassed um, because I'm diabetic and now I have this new thing and it was it was hard mostly because of all the uncertainty yeah, at first. But after I knew what was going on and, and stuff like that, I, I calmed down and and uh, decided to to battle the adversity. Battling adversity is a decision, and you have to make that decision every day. But yeah, you know, it was it was really tough to accept it at first, really tough. And, you know, everyone's going to go through some hard times in their lives and and it's okay to to be upset sometimes. But I I learned to uh to make the decision to battle adversity. I I made the decision and that's one thing that my coach would say at UCSB. It's a decision to to work hard. It's a decision to to focus. It's a decision to take care of your body. Everything is a decision and, and you need to make that decision um, because you're the, the one to take care of yourself. So, so yeah, you know, I, I eventually, well, not eventually quickly, I quickly came to the realization that, Hey, I, I'm in control. I, I need to take care of this. Yeah. And strength is, is a decision and uh, courage is a decision. And that's one thing I learned uh, through diabetes and, and through through my coach, definitely. I love it. Yeah, that's such an important mindset. And I, I wanted to ask, Billy, for people who are struggling to make that decision, maybe they were just recently diagnosed and maybe they're in denial about their diabetes and they could just be going through a rough patch. What would be your advice to that person, to that diabetic, so that they could make that decision and that they under that they can understand how that decision will affect their lives going forward. Life with good blood sugar is basically a normal life. But yeah, you know, when you have good control of your blood sugar, you just feel so good and you feel normal. And, and it's just such a reward for working hard when by uh, checking your blood sugar often, by eating right, by exercising, it's, it's such a reward to have good blood sugar. And, and after I got this freestyle Libre uh, continuous glucose monitor, it, I, I've been just feeling so good. And it's, it's just so rewarding. And I'm so happy uh, to have good blood sugar because I can, I can do so many fun things like ride my bike uh, with my friends and, and play soccer and, and play baseball back then. It's such a reward, but, but don't, 
uh, one piece of advice I would say is um, it's definitely hard. It's definitely hard, and no one says it's easy. So, yeah, I, I had to acknowledge that it's it's not easy. It's it's difficult, and you have to uh, just battle adversity and, and do it, and it's very rewarding when when you work hard and deal with it. And And everyone around me has just been so accepting of it. My family is, is rooting for me and always taking care of me, especially my mom and all my friends too. They, they don't look at me as, as some weird person. They definitely don't. They, they just really accept me for who I am and, and they take care of me. And, and I've never met a person who uh, looked down upon me because I, I have to check my blood sugar and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I would say my advice is it's just so award, uh, rewarding to, uh, have good blood sugar. It's, it's just awesome. And I, I feel so good when my blood sugar is good. Yeah. And on the topic of conquering things and overcoming adversity, you talked earlier about the next thing you have on your list of, of things to accomplish is climbing Mount Whitney. So talk about transitioning out of baseball and, and trying to remain active, trying to uh, stay fit and, and make sure that you're setting goals that kind of push you outside your comfort zone. So I remember I was in the hospital for my cancer and I was laying on the bed and I told my dad, all right, I'm going to climb Mount Whitney. So I want to, uh, I not only want to get back on my feet, but I want to get back on my feet and exceed and, and go higher. Uh, when I, when I got knocked down last year, I just don't want to be stagnant. I want to get back up and work even harder and, and try something new and accomplish something new. So, yeah, Mount Whitney is 14,500 feet. It's located in central California, and it's only mountains in Alaska or higher. So I thought that this would be a fun experience. And I actually tried it this summer, and I had to turn around. I was about, I would say, 13,000 feet, and my blood sugar was really going crazy. I was going low very quickly, and then I would eat stuff and drink stuff and I would go really high really quickly and I would try to balance my basal rate. I would sometimes turn off my pump or I would sometimes lower my basal rate and all that stuff. And um, I would really try to, to combat my blood sugar, but it just went really crazy. So I had to turn around. Um, and even, you know, even having diabetes for about 12 years, I'm still learning. It's uh, the learning process will never end. So I'm uh, going to try to climb it next year and hopefully I'll be successful. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's all a learning process and I have never been up to 13,000 feet before. And I never uh, knew how to do that uh, in terms of diabetic stuff. So, so it's all a learning process and, you know, we're all going to get, get blood sugar issues, you know, no, ma no matter how old you are, no, no matter how long you've had diabetes, it's all a learning process every day. And one thing that I want to focus on is not letting that upset me of having to turn around because I just didn't know how, how to control it. So, so now I'm going to, uh, and now I'm better prepared and now I uh, have a little bit more experience and knowledge on what to do. So hopefully I can do it uh, next year. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, and uh, it's just a beautiful mountain. It's it's just awesome, and yeah, it, staying fit uh, as a diabetic um, is really important to uh, continue continue to exercise and and be active. Um, so I've I've been uh, running around my neighborhood doing some runs, and that's just been really beneficial to my blood sugar as well. So I would encourage everybody to exercise a little bit. And exercise goes a long way with diabetes. I, lear I learned that if I run um, a mile or two on one day, my blood sugar would remain low, or not, not low, but remain normal for the next few days. It would really help keeping my blood sugar, blood sugar uh, m you know, mild for the next few days. You know, I could not run again for the next few days, but my blood sugar, I, I see – signs of it uh, staying normal. So, so a little bit of exercise goes a long way and it helps out a lot. And we're very lucky to be able to uh, stay active as diabetics. You know, we're very lucky that even with our disease, we could, 
we could still do some awesome things and fun things. So, so that's a better side to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, diet and then also fitness are, are two of the most important factors that if you can utilize those in, in your life and, and apply those to your diabetes, you're going to see massive returns in terms of more stable blood sugars, just less spikes and obviously less lows as well. But I think you touched on another important point, Billy, in that diabetes is a learning process every day. And even for the people who have the most dialed in A1Cs and uh, the best treatment out there, everyone has more to learn. And even the people with the best management are going to have rough days. And there's always something more to learn. You know, case in point in your story, Mount Whitney. But at the same time, taking that having to turn around and not being upset and frustrated and disappointed by that experience, mm-hmm. but learning how to apply that the next time around. And yeah. That's a, huge, that's a huge realization for all diabetics to be able to apply that mindset. But Billy, it was an honor talking to you. And um, do you have any of anything else for the T1D community? Sure. Um, I, I, I don't know if uh, um, this is sort of applicable to everyone. But since I am no longer playing baseball, I had to adjust my diet a little bit more to uh, help my blood sugar out Um, because with baseball, I would just be running around every day. And so that would keep my blood sugar down and I would have to eat a ton of food to keep my caloric intake, you know, even. So, So after baseball, I decided to eat less carbs and that would limit the spike um, after meals. So eating less carbs helped me to even out my blood sugar a lot more. And I'm not sure if that's applicable to everyone, but that is what I have tried. And it's uh, working out really well. And my blood sugar has been uh, doing good. So yeah, that's one thing I learned very recently. I'm a huge low carb diet guy myself. And as much as fitness and exercise gets talked about, and I, I don't want to underplay that at all it's hugely important but if you can go about your day and have you know like what I like to do is a big egg scrambled breakfast with a bunch of veggies there's no carbs in that that's a great way yeah. to start your day mm-hmm. your will thank you and you're just yes. going to see much much more stability and then you layer in the fitness on top of that then you're really cooking and um, if you can do those two things in fitness and diet that's going to go a long way. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing too is everyone is different. Everyone's bodies react with certain foods differently and everyone reacts to exercise differently. So, uh, so one thing to do is really pay attention to, to your body. Um, some things that I say might not work for you, you know, or might not work as good for you or might even work better for you. Like with me, one thing really uh, brings up my, oh sugar tablets, um, those glucose tablets bring up my blood sugar more than it says. That's one thing I learned. So, so everyone's different, and and uh, learn how uh, your body reacts, and your body will thank you. Your blood sugar will thank you. Like we said, it's that constant learning process, and you gotta you gotta be willing to to kind of put in the time to research what works and what doesn't for you. It's such a huge part of the process, but. Billy, thanks so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed talking to you. I'm Billy Frederick. I have type 1 diabetes, and I have a game plan. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Game Plan T1D podcast. For related content, please visit www.gameplant1d.com or follow us on social media at GamePlanT1D. Find your game.